Hey, welcome to the Greg Steer Youth Ministry Podcast. I really encourage you uh, to listen to this podcast, to subscribe to it, to rate it, to review it, to get the word out on social media. Help us spread the word that it's time for a revolution in youth ministry. And I'm super excited about this summer podcast series that we're going to be doing. It's going to be all based on a movement that rocked our world called Movements That Changed the World. Uh, by Steve Addison. And in this book, he talks about five keys to movements throughout history. And we see them rooted in scripture. Uh, And we actually did our first Gospel Advancing Summit based on these five truths. So we're going to be unpacking those over the course of this summer. So today we're going to be talking about rapid mobilization with my good friend, Gustavo Gonzalez. He's going to use the story of Jesus and how he mobilized his disciples rapidly to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to learn a lot from this excellent session. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Es un placer estar aquí. I'll switch. Don't worry. I'm not going to preach in Spanish. So it's uh, definitely a, a privilege to be here with you guys. Uh, but I'll be honest. When I was tasked with preaching about rapid mobilization, For some weird reason, the first thing that came to my mind was a pretty embarrassing story that happened to me when I was younger. But then as as I thought about it, I said, you know, I'm going to be in front of a group of, you know, distinguished youth leaders. And probably they don't want to hear about an embarrassing story that I have to share, right? (laughs) Or probably you would. So, yeah, I mean, I'll... It was maybe I was uh, in college, first years in college. I was waiting for one, my best friend to come pick me up to go to, to the mall. In Puerto Rico, we have the biggest mall in the Caribbean. It's called Plaza Las Americas. Uh, but as I was waiting for him, I got hungry. So I said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warm some. I'm going to heat up some uh, meatballs with sauce. So I put them in the microwave. And as soon as I press start, my friend's my friend arrives, all right? So I was like, okay, I took them out of the microwave, you know, before I I should have, they were still cold, and I ate them in a hurry, so bear that in mind, right? So we get it, we get to the mall, and you know, we're going store to store, and suddenly we're on the hallway, and I felt like someone took Rambo's knife and just stuck it in my gut. I was like, oh, uh uh-oh. So in my mind, I start mapping the whole mall, trying to remember where the closest bathroom is. And as I'm suffering there, the lady with the pretzels comes in. Would you like to? No, man, I don't want no pretzels. And then I remember that the closest one was in a JCPenney store. It was a four-story store. Bear that in mind. So as I, I said, all right, let's go there. So we start moving, and I go as fast as I can, right? I'm, I'm like <laughs> trying to get there. And as soon as I get into the, the entrance of the, 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 the store, I'm, at the distance, I see the sign that says, bathroom. And he had like a special glow. It was, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was my mind, right? So I said, all right, let's go. And we get there in a rush. I'm like, wait for me. So when we get there, only to know that he was out of service. So they told me the nearest one, sir, is on the fourth floor. I tell you, this, is, this was like the farthest trip I've ever been, you know, on foot. So I'm, I'm suffering, I'm sweating cold, and we're moving up the escal- escalators, and we finally get to, that, to the place, and it was a pretty nice place, you know? It was like a suite with wooden tones, and it was, oh, this is a pretty nice... Anyway, I have to go to the bathroom. So when I finally got to my, my, my place, my stall, I mean... It was my worst nightmares were realized, you know. I'm going to spare you the details, but just know this. I went back home without underwear, right? So (laughs) as I was sitting there, as I was sitting there, you know, I heard grown men rushing out of the bathroom. (laughs) One of them had his his son, his small child, said, come on, son, let's go, let's go, we might die in here, let's go, forget about it, and I was miserable, but I was happy, because I was able to get there rapidly, not in time, but rapidly, right, so after everybody left the area, of course, I got out, you know, and I'm looking for my friend, and he's sitting by the elevators, 
quietly laughing, literally <laughs> drinking his tears, because apparently everybody in the area knew what just took place in the men's bathroom, right? <laughs> so immediately, I, you know, we, we left at that, at that moment. You know, I was going commando. I was not going to buy anything. I said, let's go home. Uh, and so that w- that's what we did. So that's the story of rapid mobilization that comes to mind. So good luck with that game. <laughs> Good luck taking that story out of your head now for the rest of the weekend, right? But obviously, that's not what we're going to be talking about this morning, right? And while preparing this message, uh, you know, we're going to be discussing about movements that change the world and not biological accidents. So this rapid mobilization, right, it's, it's one of those characteristics of movements that change the world. And we are all part of the greatest movement this world has ever seen that was started more than 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. And we know this, right? But we also want to see something happening. We want to see the gospel exploding in our midst in our day. Right, but more than often we need to. More than often we have to go back to Jesus as our reference to see how do we do this. Right, after all, he's the founder of this amazing movement that we are all part of. So here in Dare to Share, guys, we are we are praying, we're strategizing, we're making alliances to be able to train and resource one million gospel advancing leaders leaders around the world. So they, in turn, inspire 10 million young people to reach the 1 billion uh, youth around the world. So the math is simple, and Jason will be uh, explaining a little bit more in detail in his breakout, but you have it here, right? So we need, uh, how do we get there, right? So we know there is about a billion teenagers. We also know that on average, every youth group has about... 10 students that they can mobilize to reach their friends. And each of those 10 students along the years of middle school and high school could influence uh, and share 100 other teenagers. So we resolve the math. And obviously that means that we need that 1 million uh, leaders all around the world. So it is the biggest generation of young people the world has ever seen. What a great opportunity we have, guys. But we need to arm ourselves with a philosophy that is biblical, effective, and scalable. A philosophy that can empower and sustain rapid mobilization. The gospel advancing philosophy. Those seven values we believe uh, is that philosophy, right? So I want to take a look at Matthew 9, 35, all the way to chapter 10, 10. And see uh, what we can get out of these portions of scriptures related to rapid mobilization. So I'm going to read it, right? It's going to be on the screen so you don't have to look for it if you don't want to. And he says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, Simon, I'm sorry, the salad, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not uh, get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bags of, uh, for, uh, for your journey or extra shirts or sandals or staff. For the worker is worth his keep. So for rapid mobilization, 
to take place, we must energize the crowds, mobilize the committed, and gospelize the communities. Energize the crowds. When a spirit-filled messenger speaks, it often causes the desire from the people that are hearing him or her to do something, to respond. We see this with John the Baptist in Luke 3.10 when the crowds ask, what should we do then? We see this with Jesus in John 3 and 4 and other places. We see it with Peter in Acts 2 and Paul in Acts 16.30. The crowds become energized and feel the need to do something. And we too need to be able to energize the crowds with the power of the Holy Spirit. But guys, to be able to do this, it must start in our own hearts. Broken hearts. In the passage that we are examining, we read that of Jesus that he had compassion on them. Jesus knew that the people are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. Yes, even that church across the street from yours. They're not the enemy. And seeing people living in a world ruled by Satan is enough reason to have compassion on, some, on someone. But then we need to realize that these people are heading to an eternity in hell without God. Our compassion should be activated. I remember years ago, um, you need to know this about me. I did not grow up in church. I became a Christian when I was 21 years old, already married and everything. So God saved me from, from, from a mess and also divorce. So praise God for that. But I remember that I grew up very, I was, I was lucky because I, where I grew up, there was about seven other uh, boys around my same age. And one of them in particular, his name is Christian, uh, was different than the rest of us because he grew up in a home without a father. You know, he hung out with the wrong crowds. He made poor decisions. He became a father as a teenager. And, and probably that's why I put him in my mind and heart as someone that I wanted to reach now that I was a believer. But the sinner I am, you know, I always found uh, an excuse to not do it as soon as sh I should have, right? And I remember I was out one night with my wife, and I received a call letting me know that my friend Christian was sick with cancer. And you can imagine what, that, what those news made to, uh, did with this thought that I had in my mind that I have all the time in the world. I didn't know exactly how to respond to that kind of news, so I started praying. And that's the second thing, guys, that we need to, for mobilization to start in our hearts bent knees in verse 38 we read ask the lord of the harvest so jesus modeled prayer to his disciples masterfully and we need to uh, take the same example as you know in the gospel advancing ministry value number one is intercessory prayer yes we pray for for our physical and situational needs but we have to pray for christians to be activated and for non-believers to have a heart to receive the gospel so that day after praying i decided to call my friend christian and you know uh, and i said listen i i heard the news that you're sick with cancer and he told me that he was cancer free at that moment so immediately in my mind you know i started saying you see, you have time. Don't worry. He's healthy. You can talk to him at other point. But then the Holy Spirit was like, no, do it now. You know, you call him for a reason. So I said, listen, man, I know this is awkward. I know we haven't seen each other for years, but can I come to your house? I, will, I would like to see you and talk to you. And he said, yes. I got there. Weirdly, he received me in the garage. He put some chairs out. He didn't let me into the house. I don't know why. But I was able to share the gospel with him as clearly as I could, right? And leaving that, that, the house, he hugged me. And he said, listen, because uh, it was a Sunday, he said, my intentions were to go to church today. Today, but I didn't because I was lazy. So I know that it was God that sent you here today. And I was like, praise the Lord. So I left. We talked a couple of times, right? Um, and I received another call months later, but this time to let me know that my friend Christian was dead. He was shot just three streets from the street that we grew up in. 
And listen, honestly, I don't know if he put his faith in Jesus on that afternoon, but I, I know that what that experience did in my heart. It put front and center the need to have a bold mouth. Chapter 10, verse 7 says, As you go, proclaim this message. We as leaders need to model a life of proclamation of the gospel. Yes, when we preach in public, but also in private. With that person that sits next to you in the plane with your neighbor, we need to have a life that models the proclamation of the gospel. So when the energizing of the crowd starts in our, with our own hearts, then it catalyzes the crowds. Some come to Christ, some will grow in Christ, and some will get on fire for Christ. And I think that's where the, most of the 72 uh, that we read in Luke 10 came from. Number two, we have to mobilize the commitment. The committed, I'm sorry. Chapter 10, verses 5 to 10. It says, verse 5, that these 12 Jesus sent out. With the following instructions. One of the keys to rapid mobilization is to send out, not keep in the committed, right? Let me tell you a story about a, a gentleman named Ralph Moore. Back in 1972, he was 25 years old and he planted the first Hope Chapel in California with just enough people to fit in a Volkswagen Beetle. By the time that church had 125 people, it had already planted a daughter church. In 1983, he moved to Hawaii and started another church under a tree in a park by the beach. Poor thing, right? <laughs> but by the year 2000, Hope Chapel, I'm going to butcher this, Kanohe Bay or something like that, Google it, had grown to 1,600 people. But that's not the impressive thing. Is that it had planted 60 churches. Ralph Moore believed that a church must be simple and it must reproduce. His small group programs, you know what it's called? Mini church. Which were the building blocks for the local church. In a mini church, a faithful group member who are influencing others are recruited as an apprentice leader and trained. Faithful apprentices become mini-church pastors. And mini-church pastors who are effective in multiplying groups and leaders are invited to join a pastor factory. And then they start growing two or three mini-churches and then take those peoples and plant a church. From the book uh, Movement That Changed the World, we read this. If Ralph had planted a church in Hawaii that grew to 10,000 people, he would be world famous. But instead, he planted a church that multiplies churches together amounting to 70,000 people. Amen. Jesus mobilized 10 on-fire teens, one adult leader, and then one rebellious teen. Yeah. But those 11 disciples are the reason that you and me are here today. This is why I love using what we call the cost circle so much. It's a simple tool to multiply disciples, right? It's, it's, it's prayer, care, and share. I always say, tell my students in my church, right? Uh, start praying for people. Talk to God about people before talking to people about God. Start serving them, caring for them. And that will open the opportunity for you to share the gospel out loud with words. And I tell them, when you have, whenever you have someone that put their trust in Jesus, they quite literally immediately can start praying for someone else. And then the circle starts over again. Um, no extensive training is necessary just the most powerful tour at tool at our disposal prayer the most effective action we can do caring and the most powerful message anyone can hear in the world the gospel so energize the crowd mobilize the committed and then gospelize the communities acts 1 8 says you will receive power when the holy spirit comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Back in Puerto Rico, we are doing an unofficial tour of Go Share Days, right? Uh, a Go Share Day is an international initiative that Dare to Share is leading uh, for the Go movement. And it's a simple strategy of gathering students on the last Saturday of every month, although you can do it any day that you want, right? Um, and just to inspire them, train them, and then send them out. Um, it's necessary to have some sort of outreach activity in the community that gives the, uh, the students the opportunity to share the gospel out loud with words. Uh, before coming here, we visited already four different churches, and it has been amazing, guys. And I have stories for each of those, but I wanted to share just two with you today. The first one is this grandma that drove one of the students to the Go Share Day. And since it was kind of far, she, she stayed there. And, and, and she heard the training. And she went out with the students, right? And, and once the, the outreach experience was over, she came back. She, was, she, she found me. And, and she was like a little girl. She was, oh, this is amazing. I've never done anything like this in my entire life. People were open to have the conversation. Some of the people put their faith in Jesus through my testimony. I cannot believe that we're not doing more of this. And I'm like, me neither. But I'm happy that you enjoy it. And then on a, on a different Go Share Day, uh, this 14-year-old girl with her group approached this, uh, this gentleman. His name is John. He's a young man. He was just getting out of his car, and they ambushed him a little. You know, a little. And she says, ah, oh, we're from so-and-so church, and we are in the community talking to people about Jesus. And at the moment she said that, this grown man broke down crying. And she was like, uh-oh, what happening? What did I say? And he said, no, this cannot be happening. This is not true. What is going on? He put his, head, his, hand, his hands to his head. And what was happening, that was God was pursuing him for about two to three months. And the funny thing is that it all started. He was getting high with a group of friends smoking marijuana. And one stoner started to share the gospel with him. And he was, I don't know, man. I don't believe in God because I don't think he's reaching out to me. And he was like, well, dude, maybe this is him reaching out to you. <laughs> right? And then all their experiences throughout the months. And that same Saturday that our group met him, his uh, stepdad slash barber, a new Christian, by the way, was sharing Jesus with him. And then he got in his car got to his house, thought he was saved, and then a 14-year-old girl ambushed him with Jesus again with her testimony. And he said, you know what? I cannot keep running away from God. Something is happening. I don't understand it. I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to put my faith in Jesus. Yeah. And you know how God uses one thing to do many things? Man, when when it was time for, for uh, testimonies, this girl stand up, share that amazing story. But then she shares her own struggles, that she's a, a, a PK, that she was not sure if her faith was her own, that she dis, she's not sure about this whole Christianity thing. But seeing the power of the Holy Spirit in action, life in front of her, transforming a life as she spoke the words of the gospel, the words of life. She said, I'm done. I don't understand everything, but I know this is real. That's the power of rapid mobilization. And not only him, many other families started going to church and they're connected. And the pastor, who is my friend, pointed this out to his church and said, hey, Fellas, this group of people are here because our students went out to the street in our community to share the gospel. And they were happy, but they were kind of surprised. I don't know why. Um, we need to normalize that kind of thing, guys. And the Spanish-speaking world will have an opportunity to unite on September 17, as Jason 
was mentioning. For the first time, we're going to do uh, Dare, uh, Dare to Share Life in Spanish. And it will be the first like naturally international event because the nature of the Hispanic, the Spanish speaking world. El Día del Evangelismo Juvenil Hispano. Take a look. nothing to do with that but thank you anyways anyways so guys if you have any connection with any spanish-speaking church or in a in spanish-speaking country send them our way we want to we want to uh, talk to them all right so i have heard something from greg once and i always use it myself we say that it's all about the power of the gospel and every christian will agree with that but also we need to see the potential of teenagers and I know I'm preaching to the choir here because that's why you are in youth ministry. But it's about to showing that potential of teenagers to everybody else in the church, right? But I have come to realize, guys, that yes, it's the potential of teenagers. But if you think about it, we're talking about the potential of the Holy Spirit. It's the actual potential of God through our students and our people that gospelize the community. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, hey, if a student of yours has tr trusted Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come into them. And the Spirit potential is boundless. Amen. Amen. Remember what Jesus says in John 14, 12. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father. And he went to the Father. But he didn't leave us alone, right? John 16, 7. He says, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. It's the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit that, is, makes, that makes this possible. Once we realize this, we can confidently continue to add, of course, come and see. Like Andrew did in, in John 141. Come and see our services. Come and see our people. Come and see our pastor, our ministry. But we can be confident in letting our students go and get like the disciples did it. Trust in the Holy Spirit. It is not your ministry. It's Jesus's. Craig Rochelle said something once. That is, is, you can have control or you can have growth. But not both. Right. So coach your students. You can say disciple them. But they, uh, be there for them. But unleash them into their school campus, their neighborhoods, their co-ops, sports team, bands, whatever it is. That is the way, I think, the only way to really gospelize all of our communities. They have as much of the Holy Spirit as you do. I'll finish with this, guys. The Holy Spirit accelerates the mobilization. Think about it. Jesus spent three and a half years of ministry and ended up with 120 disciples versus, I don't know, three and a half hours of the apostles with the Holy Spirit. About 3,000 souls are recorded in Acts chapter 2 were all saved. Chapter 2 all the way to verse 41. And by the way, if you read that portion, you know, slowly, it takes about three and a half minutes to read it out loud. 
So we have that Holy Spirit. We have uh, that power in our midst and your students too. Just make them realize what is in them. The power that he has arose Jesus from the dead. They created the world from nothing, and he can save their friends. Amen? Amen. All right, Father, you are awesome indeed. You are so good, God, all the time. It's unbelievable, Father. You created the universe. You put everything into motion. You sustain everything with the power of your word. But you have decided, Father, to care for us and love us. And not only that, God, you ask us to be a part of this amazing mission. God, thank you so much because you are good, you are great, you are awesome, you are powerful and big, but we can still call you daddy. Father, give us the wisdom, give us the words, give us the um, experience to be able to um, communicate this conviction to our students and our churches. Father, thank you because we know, we know you're moving in mighty, mighty ways all around the world. And thank you for this group of leaders that is here this weekend and everything that they do for you. Guard them, empower them, and keep them, Father, in your mission. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I hope you were inspired by today's talk. And our challenge is this. Would you become a gospel advancing leader? There is a movement that's changing the world. Jesus is our gospel advancing leader, but I want to define for you, what does that mean for you as a youth leader, a leader of youth? What is a gospel advancing leader? It's this, one who personally shares the gospel and mobilizes teenagers to do the same. So I challenge you to make that commitment. How do you do that? Go to gospeladvancing.org and click join now. And when you do that, you just, you come in to this fraternity of youth leaders and pastors and moms and dads and even teenagers that are saying, yes, we're going to personally share the gospel. We're going to mobilize teenagers to do the same. Listen, this whole movement is about changing the world. What's going to do that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And who does it faster than anybody? Teenagers. They come to Christ quicker. They spread the gospel faster. So I hope you've enjoyed today's episode Uh, of the Greg Steer Youth Ministry Podcast. And remember, a youth ministry that changes the world is one that advances the gospel of Christ.